Welcome everyone to Bridging Realities Policy and Eviction, presented by the A plus D Museum's Inclusion and Community Committee. Before we begin, I want to do a few thank yous. I want to thank the museum and the board of directors. I also want to thank the Inclusion and Community Committee. Uh, I want to thank everybody at home for taking some time to learn and hear about these important issues. And of course, I want to thank our esteemed panelists that we have here today as well. My name is Nick McGrew. I am a business and real estate transactional attorney as well as a tenured professor, and I'm a member of the A plus B's Community and Inclusion Committee. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists right now, but we'll have plenty of time to get to know them and talk with them more a little bit later. Um, so on the panel today, we have David Waite, a land use attorney and partner at Cox Castle Nicholson. We have Rachel Rossi, former federal public defender and current criminal justice reform advocate. And we have, we're welcoming back Adam Murray, an attorney and executive director of the Inner City Law Center. So before we get into all the good stuff, I wanted to take a little time to talk about the committee, uh, the thought process behind that, behind this, and give you an idea of the format of our programming for today. So about a year ago, uh, the committee was getting together, trying to figure out what our programming for 2020 would be. And so as we were thinking, we said, you know, it might be interesting to look at how architecture, design, and the ancillary industries that uh, deal with the built environment, we, we wanted to look at how they interplay, for better or for worse, with our city's houselessness crisis. Um, and so we've got some great panelists today that do work on the commercial and development side. We have some that work uh, from the criminal justice side, and then also some that work directly with those that are being removed from their homes. Um, and so today we bring to you Bridging Realities Policy and Eviction Panel. So how our program is going to go is that uh, I'll introduce each panelist one at a time and they'll have a few moments to share some of their thoughts and their experience and their connection to the topic. We also have a few prepared questions that I'll be moderating once we have all three panelists introduced. And for you at home, please feel free to submit your questions as well um, because I'll be looking through them and some of the other committee members will also and time permitting, we will try to get some of your questions answered directly as well. Now, I know you all didn't come here to hear me talk, so let's get our, our uh, program started. So we're going to start with David Waite. David is a partner at Cox Castle and Nicholson. He has over 25 years of land use and environmental experience. He's a member of the Counselors of Real Estate, a fellow of the American College of Real Estate Lawyers, and is a past chair of the Urban Land Institute's Los Angeles District Council. Welcome, David, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate the introduction, and it's uh, it's great to be participating uh, today uh, in this topic. And I appreciate everybody taking time out over the weekend to come and and, and learn a little bit about this most important area and, and challenge that we're facing, not only in Los Angeles but but a national crisis on homelessness. And so we're we're really pleased that people are are engaged in this topic, and it's it's ever more increasing and important. Um, I'm sure it's probably known well to everybody on the call, and if it isn't, um, our homelessness uh, count in Los Angeles this past year uh, continues to go in the wrong direction. Uh, we are now at 66,000 uh, plus uh, on the street in Los Angeles County, uh, representing a 12% increase from last year. Um, in addition, uh, the disparity uh, on uh, minorities and men and women of color uh, continues at its uh, continue, continues at its alarming rate. We are uh, at nine percent of our community in Los Angeles are men and women of color. Yet uh, over thirty percent of the homeless population is represented by men and women of color. So we have real disparities in terms of economic impact uh, that we're facing. I think one of the issues um, that we really have to confront uh, is. Uh, the overall housing supply and the housing affordability problem, because that in turn leads itself to increasing homelessness among all communities, but most particularly uh, the minority community is adversely impacted. And that, uh, the statistics I'm sure many, are you, uh, many of you are aware of, 
Um, homelessness starts rising uh, when um, uh, rents uh, start to exceed 22% of median income. And they all of a sudden start taking an even more precipitous rise when uh, they hit 32% of median income. And in Los Angeles County, um, the median rent is now at 46.7% of median income. So that statistic alone tells you one of the reasons why we have a very profound problem in Los Angeles. Uh, we have rising rents, we have lack of supply, and we have declining wages in many cases and stagnant wages in many other cases. And so this is why we continue to see um, these very substantial increases, both in terms of total numbers and percentages uh, of folks on the street uh, every year, year in, year out. There are some bright spots, and I think it's important to mention those bright spots um, because we are making some important strides uh, in terms of how we're uh, addressing homelessness uh, in Los Angeles County. Um, we have uh, created uh, lots of new shelters uh, in Los Angeles County. Um, in 2019, we rehoused 22,769 people into permanent supportive housing. Uh, many more people uh, occupied interim uh, housing uh, this past year in 2019, 18,395 people uh, found uh, shelters this past year. Uh, the impact of the uh, Los Angeles Bridge Home Program uh, saw a 39% increase uh, in the shelter population. It went from 8,944 in 2018 up to 12,438 in 2019. So. Uh, there are some, some bright spots, uh, despite the overwhelming uh, negative challenges that we face. Um, we had 732 new permanent supportive housing units come online in 2019. Uh, we have 2,360 that are scheduled to come online in 2020. And we have a total construction pipeline of uh, over 10,000 units, nearly 11,000 units, 10,600 units that are uh, being planned for uh, in the current pipeline. So. There are some positive developments. There's a, a, a lot of obviously still very, very significant challenges, uh, but we do have uh, some, some positivity. Um, and I'll end with just sort of one sort of, sort of note uh, in terms of the challenge. Um, while we have again these positive developments, which are on average, uh, we see about in the last year, about 207 uh, individuals who find housing uh, in the calendar year, we have 227 who are actually coming into homelessness. So if you look at that disparity, we have simply more coming into the system than we are providing housing for. So we are, we are at a net loss uh, every year and that's why we continue to see uh, these increases. So, um, you know, and I come at this from the perspective of a land use lawyer who's involved in entitlement and permitting. Uh, I'm very focused on how we can shorten the timeframes for how we can bring all manner of shelters online, whether it's temporary shelters, bridge housing, or permanent supportive housing, what are the ways that we can bring those uh, projects online uh, faster? Uh, how can we uh, lower the construction costs to bring units online for lower costs? So I'm very sort of focused on those issues as a land use professional. Um, I sit on the board of the Skid Row Housing Trust and we deal with these issues literally every day in terms of how we are trying to meet these challenges. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenging um, problems that are still out there, uh, but there are some positive developments and I don't, I don't want to lose sight of those as well. So um, those, I guess, Nick, would be my kind of opening comments and I, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, David. Yes, I look forward to getting into that more as well. Next, we have Rachel Rossi. Rachel is a former LA County and federal public defender uh, she has also served as counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. Prior to that, she was counsel to Senator Richard Durbin, where she was the lead staffer on the criminal justice reform bill, the First Step Act. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to the A Plus D Museum and for all of the esteemed panelists here today. I'm very honored to join you um, as we discuss this very, very important topic 
Um, one of the things that I think is important to recognize is how houselessness really intersects with the criminal justice system. Um, and that's something that I've seen throughout my career in a lot of different ways. Um, but probably the most impactful way that I've seen that intersection is by representing people in the system who are houseless, who are arrested for offenses that are very closely tied um, to lack of housing and to watching um, what the system does when you're released from prison or jail um, and you're more likely to end up becoming houseless. Um, data shows that formerly incarcerated people are over 10 times more likely to become houseless. Um, and so as we're discussing and having a conversation about houselessness here in Los Angeles, um, it's very important, I think, for us to focus on the intersectionality with the criminal justice system and with all of the other systems that sort of work together um, in our county and in our city. Um, I think what I would love to focus on in this conversation is how can we work together? How can all of these facets of our society um, look and say, not that's your job, but what's my job? How can I be a part of it? How can we look at data? How can we look at what works and what doesn't work? Um, and really focus on providing resources and stability to our um, houseless community in order to decrease houselessness and to not perpetuate this cycle of incarceration and houselessness and more incarceration. Um, so thank you again for having me. I'm very excited to have this conversation today. Thank you, Rachel. And yes, we will get into kind of that cycle that you talked about as well. Next up, we're welcoming back Adam Murray. Adam is the executive director of the Inner City Law Center, a nonprofit poverty law firm serving Los Angeles. In his 13 years as the director, he has increased both the budget and the staff more than tenfold, which allows the organization to serve more Angelinos and create groundbreaking programs that meet the needs of their clients that are um, uh, there's part of the homeless community that consists of parents, children, as well as veterans in our city as well. Uh, welcome, Adam. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here uh, and a pleasure to get to listen to David and Rachel introduce uh, this issue. Um, a couple things that maybe I'll add as, as we're starting here. The first is to point out uh, for me personally that I have two young kids. And if, heaven forbid, either of them ever became homeless, I would want everyone who possibly could, anyone, anybody listening to this, anybody else they came into contact with, to do absolutely everything you could to help them. It would not matter to me why they got there, or how they ended up there, or what the situation was. I would want everybody who could to roll up their sleeves and help them. And I think we are not bringing that urgency to this problem. We are not recognizing that everybody on the streets is somebody's kid, is somebody's child, and we need to step up um, and do a lot more. When you think about how to solve homelessness, I think you really have to start, and I encourage the people who are listening to this, to really start with the root of what is homelessness. Homelessness is the lack of a home. And so if you wanna solve homelessness, you have to ask, what is the pathway to long-term stable housing? What is that for an individual? What is that for a family? What is that for a community? On whatever scale you're looking at. But that's the fundamental question we have to grapple with. What does it look like to get somebody or to keep somebody in long-term stable housing. That's how you end homelessness. For most people, that boils down to some assistance with their housing directly. That could be helping them pay rent, helping them navigate a landlord-tenant dispute. It could be you know, something that's very housing specific. And very often, other things that they're struggling with in their life as well are relevant. So there's a housing component and a broader sort of social services component. Um, at Inner City Law Center, uh, for example, we have a homeless vets project that helps veterans who have uh, been unsuccessful at accessing VA benefits to appeal those denials, get access to the benefits. You know, last year we helped uh, our clients collect over $4 million in veterans benefits. So those individuals now have income that they can spend on rent. Uh, in addition to having health care and the other things they need to stabilize their lives. So it's identifying for the individual who you're working with, or if you're working on, on a more of a policy basis, what are the barriers to long-term stable housing and how do we remove them? I think um, you know, David's comments about rent and the cost of housing are really at the cent center of this. 
in between, in my mind, in between 2000 and 2017, the median rent in LA County went up by 32% and the median renter income went down by 3% in that same time period. So you have rents going up dramatically and renter incomes either stagnating or going down. And that disconnect is why we have 79% of low income, extremely low income renters in Los Angeles today pay 50% or more of their income to rent. Those are the folks who one thing goes wrong and they're out on the streets. There's no safety net, they're barely getting by, and it's hundreds of thousands of people in Los Angeles. That disconnect is the root. There's lots of other factors, you know, as, as the comments have already indicated and as your opening did, Nick, this is a complicated multifaceted issue, but at root, it is the disconnect between people's incomes and the increasing cost of rents. And we got to figure out how we're going to change that. The estimate is in Los Angeles County that we need 509,000 units of affordable housing, new units, half a million new units of affordable housing. That is the thing that in my mind would make the biggest difference. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that that's housing, not shelter. Most of what we do around homelessness is to alleviate the suffering of people on the streets. We provide food, we provide shelter, we provide emergency health care, all of which are absolutely essential to do because people are suffering on the streets and we need to address that uh, as a humane place or as a should be a more humane place than we are. But most of those things actually don't put people on a different trajectory with respect to that long-term stable housing. That's a different question. That's a different issue. One is alleviating the immediate suffering and the other is what is actually going to solve homelessness. And I think we have to be really hard headed about the fact that we have to do both, but we need to do a lot more of the ending homelessness. The last thing I'll say is that um, this has already been alluded to, but there was a really significant racial dimension uh, to this problem that we should not overlook. Um, you know, as has been stated, 9%, about 8% of people in LA County are African American, and yet 34% of people who are on the streets tonight are African American. The national numbers are about 40% of people who are experiencing homelessness are African American. This is a staggering number. And it sort of goes back to what I said at the outset about my children, right? As a, as a, a lawyer, as a white middle class, you know, middle aged lawyer, everybody will end up on the streets for lots of different reasons. But the people who are most likely to end up on the street are black and brown, low income folks. And we need to, to recognize the humanity of all of us and really embrace that this is something we're all gonna have to dig in and solve and not act like it's happening to someone else's kids. Uh, we gotta recognize that you know, it's all of our kids and we gotta really embrace that even with the disparities as to who's most likely to end up on the streets. Thank you so much. We have a wonderful panel here. I'm very excited to start asking you all some questions. Before we get too deep into the weeds, um, if you've noticed, we have here a panel of attorneys here. And so I promised the uh, committee members that we wouldn't have a whole lot of legalese. Um, I do, we did send you guys the questions in advance. And when we, when we were creating them, we kind of had some of you in mind for some of them or other ones. But everyone, please feel free to chime in uh, whenever uh, you have something to input. So our first one um, is to kind of make sure that we uh, have a, a solid base for everybody at home. So can somebody kind of tell us the intersection of policy and law and, and what it goes into the process of going from having policies to actual laws themselves? Um, so I, I'll take a stab at that, uh, Nick, just to get us started, but obviously you know, policy is formed at typically a, a legislative level. Uh, it starts with an idea uh, by hopefully one of our legislative leaders and uh, to actually then go from a policy that's being pursued to actually creating laws on the books um, is complicated. Uh, it involves, you know, going through a legislative proposal usually carried by a sponsor, uh, you know, whether that be the federal government um, uh, a congressman uh, or woman or a senator, uh, and at the state level, uh, one of our assembly uh, persons or local uh, senators would carry that legislation. And then it goes through the process of review and analysis uh, in the legislative sessions and the various legislative committees. 
And then ultimately, if it is successful, it is voted upon by the legislature um, and ultimately declared law upon the signing of that legislation by the governor of the state of California. So it's time consuming. It is process driven. It is uh, transparent within the legislative process, but it usually starts with an idea and an initiative at the policy level that somebody wants to try to change something to address a impediment uh, that needs, needs to be changed. So that's, that's kind of the legislative process. If I can jump in on that, Nick, I, I think the, um, the other thing I would add is that there is a, um, and it's relevant for the guests, I think, because there is a political pressure and an involvement aspect to this. Our elected officials who are in, uh, uh, implementing the process that David just described are all susceptible and all responsive to varying degrees to what their constituents are saying they want. And so if we wanna see that process work in a certain way and end up with a certain result, we all need to be raising our voices and we all need to be insisting that our elected officials are addressing these issues. These issues are not easy to solve, right? We're stuck with them because they're expensive and they're difficult and they're multifaceted and they're challenging and there's political pressures to resist just about everything we wanna to do to try to make things better. We need to overcome that and that's only gonna happen if a lot of people raise their voice and insist that their elected officials solve these issues and put more resources into it and do more. And so there's a, there's a the, the technical, it's important we all understand the technical pieces of it, but at the end of the day, it's political pressure on that process and insisting that our elected officials do what we want them to do uh, and raising our voices about that that's gonna make the change. And, and I'll just add, Adam, to that point. In California, we have a long history of direct democracy when our legislators don't listen to, uh, to, to, to the constituents. And so that's why we have a very long tradition in California of seeing multiple initiatives on the ballot. I'm sure we're all looking at our, 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 our ballot uh, pamphlets that were mailed out last week and all the initiatives that are on the ballot. That's direct democracy. That is, that is the voters taking legislation into their own hands and saying, we want change and we are bringing that to the voters directly. And we have a long history uh, of direct democracy in California. So to Adam's point, when the legislators don't, legislators don't listen, the voters take matters into their own hands. And I'll just jump in and add to what David and Adam are talking about. Um, you know, they're absolutely correct about the legislative process, the ballot initiatives. Um, and then we have, you know, at a very local level, we have our city council and we have considerations that may seem small, but, you know, budget. Where is money going? Is it going toward... Um, services, treatment, um, housing, or is it going toward other efforts within our jurisdictions? Um, and then you have some considerations like prosecutors who have discretion. Um, whatever the laws are on the books, prosecutors get to decide who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. Um, very, very broad discretion that is very un unchecked and it's within their um, authority to make those decisions. Um, so all of this sort of intersects because we have these federal laws, we have these state laws, we have these local officials making very important decisions. And sometimes it can seem like a lot, um, but finding a way to get engaged and understand each of these processes will help to ensure that all of us are doing just like Adam said, getting that pressure out there, that um, understanding out there that the people want to see change and the people want to see houselessness decline. Thank you. Rachel, you mentioned um, prosecutor discretion, which is a great segue into one of the next questions. Um, we often, it's easy for us to recognize if somebody's you know, stealing a stereo, it's easier, easy for us to see that that's a crime. Um, but we often don't think of a landlord raising rents higher than lawfully allowed as stealing. And many times our laws kind of reflect that uh, in that, you know, we will punish somebody for stealing a stereo, but are not necessarily punishing landlords that are not following uh, the, the laws as well. Um, so can anybody shed some light on that or highlight any disparate treatment that you've seen? And more so some suggestions on how we can um, address those. Yeah, so, so one of the, I think, things about the criminal justice system that we don't ordinarily think about is that so much of the decision making on how and when and where to prosecute is really in the hands of your elected prosecutor. Um, 
And federally, um, it's a little more complicated because you have um, United States attorneys who are directly connected to the um, attorney general. Um, but you have this discretion where prosecutors kind of get to decide where to really put resources. And the reason that is, is because there are a lot of laws on the books and prosecutors could not prosecute every single crime that happens um, every day. So you do have offenses like, you know, for example, um, if you um, seek to evict someone from their home and you utilize uh, the other, the experts in housing law and this panel will know this a little bit better than I do, but there are requirements that you cannot evict people in certain circumstances. And you, when you, um, circumvent those circumstances. It could be fraud. It could be even felony fraud. Um, and so prosecutors can take a look at that and decide whether or not to prosecute that. Thank you. So turning to some uh, other areas dealing specifically with housing uh, policies, um, you know, one of the other questions, I think David, you mentioned that, you know, policy takes time. And Adam, you mentioned, you know, we've got to talk to our elected officials. Um, and, you know, sometimes it almost feels a bit, bit like we're a bit helpless. You know, uh, houselessness, the unhoused crisis has been on many people's radars for quite a long time in LA. Um, but there, and there's been so much focus and notoriety, but do you have any insights as to why, at least seemingly, that we haven't been able to take bigger strides in resolving some of these issues? I'll, I'll jump in uh, uh, initially, Nick, and just give you my perspective. It's uh, the, the projects that uh, are being planned for, designed, uh, and, and built, um, they, are, they have to go through the same land use process as any other project. So invariably, there's an entitlement process for any type, certainly of any permanent supportive housing uh, project. Uh, perhaps less so for some of the temporary shelters and, and perhaps some of the bridge housing, but certainly for permanent supportive housing, these are permanent installations uh, and they are, you know, mul essentially multifamily developments that go through uh, a variety of uh, permits and approvals with the city of Los Angeles, uh, not the least of which for a long time, they were subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. And that was a time consuming process to go through in terms of environmental review, uh, evaluating traffic, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, all those types of things that really take time. The other piece that I think is also incredibly time consuming is the capital stack for financing a permanent supportive housing project is very complex, actually much more complex in many ways than a market-based um, private housing project because you are usually uh, funding those projects through uh, the tax credit uh, programs. And invariably there may be six, seven, eight, or even sometimes as many as 10 or 12 different capital sources that are financing those projects. And so in, a, in order for them to qualify for their tax credits, uh, there are a number of certifications that have to be applied for and obtained. And these take a long time. So part of the impediment to bringing more units online, particularly in the permanent supportive housing space, which by the way, to Adam's question and point about people staying in, 88% of the people who went in per permanent supportive housing in 2018 stayed in in 2019. So these are the most uh, robust in terms of uh, keeping people you know, in housing and with uh, access to services. So they are, they are the gold standard, if you will, uh, for long-term uh, solutions for, for those who are experiencing homelessness, but they take time. Uh, they're also very expensive. Um, you've all seen the statistics. On average in Los Angeles County, these are running about 514,000 per unit to develop. Um, and that's, that's very expensive housing. And that again, highlights the challenges in Los Angeles. So I guess I would break it down into kind of three areas, Nick. One is the entitlement timeline, the capital uh, stack or the capital financing that's utilized for the project and construction costs. Lining all that up for particularly permanent supportive housing takes time. That's why you see the frustration uh, of how long it takes to deploy the Measure Triple H funding to get units online and get people into those units 
uh, and it's usually running about two to three years from inception to actually putting people in those units. Uh, we can talk a little bit about temporary shelters and bridge housing because they're a little bit different, but the permanent supportive housing projects are, are time consuming and complicated. And one of the things we're trying to do is make them less complicated, make the financing more readily available and actually lower construction costs. If we can do those three things, we can start to have real impact on a much shorter time horizon. So Nick, if I can piggyback on that, the, the permanent support housing that David's talking about is clearly the solution for people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. Right? It's about a third of the people who are homeless on any given night in LA County. Um, and that's folks who have been homeless continuously for a year or four times in the last three years and have some sort of disabling condition. So they're struggling with serious issues and they're repeatedly homeless or homeless for a long period of time. And the permanent supportive housing that David is talking about is expensive in part uh, for a whole bunch of reasons that he's talked about, but also because it needs to be built in a way that allows people to get services as well as the housing at their location. So it's targeting those, those folks. And I think everything he said, I agree with about we need to figure out ways to bring down the cost, particularly of that housing. But I would add that we are not thinking on a scale um, that is appropriate for this problem. And I think no matter what we do with bringing down the cost, unless we increase the scale that we are talking and thinking about, we're gonna to continue to be in the situation where the voters are gonna say, didn't we already do something? Why haven't we solved this? What's going on? You know, Measure HHH is going to ultimately build 7,640 units, right? Over this 10 year period, or probably won't take quite that long, but over that period of time, that's the biggest thing we're doing on homelessness, housing for people who are homeless, 7,600 units. Right? There are 66,000 people tonight in LA County, right? and that's a point in time count. Right? Over the course of the year, it's more like 150, 160,000. Um, and that's just this year. Right? That housing is not all going to be available this year. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's half a million units that we need. So how do we go from 7,600 units to half a million units? That's where the conversation needs to go. And it's not exactly the same sort of housing. We don't need half a million units of permanent supportive housing. We don't need housing with services at the same way. We need more of it, but it's a lot of other affordable housing that we need as well. And so I think part of what's missing is that we come up with these solutions like Triple H, which I'm incredibly supportive of and think is a wonderful thing and is gonna help a whole lot of folks, but it's not on a scale that our problem is on. And we have to, to figure out how we scale up these solutions and other solutions so that we're actually talking about policies that would solve homelessness in Los Angeles rather than just nip at the edges of it. Right. I'll kind of piggyback on this a little bit. Um, David, you're mentioning you know, the timelines of entitlements and things like that. And California, off, or many places in, with real estate development generally, but California specifically, um, it gets the reputation of having a lot of bureaucratic red tape uh, to get through in order to get projects completed. Um, do you have any recommendations to ease this process, especially, you know, when we're thinking about regulations, they're usually there to protect some in some ways. And so when you, you're thinking about pulling back regulations, you often want to be conscious because you might lose those protections. Um, do you have any uh, recommendations to ease the process while still uh, maintaining these protections for citizens? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Nick. I mean, we've seen some progress with uh, the so-called exemptions under the California Environmental Quality Act uh, for certain types of uh, facilities uh, that, that uh, qualify for the exemptions, which means that they don't have to go through the CEQA process uh, and, and do the CEQA analysis. But ultimately, it's really about neighborhoods and about community, because even with removing the bureaucratic red tape, what we really have to make sure we do is we educate the community about what the project is going to be and engage that community because the knee jerk sort of, you know, not in my backyard, the NIMBY reaction that we get in, in most communities is, oh, I just, we don't want to have a shelter in our neighborhood. It's going to attract more, uh, uh, quote, undesirables, if you will. Uh, you know, it's all of that kind of narrative out there that is, is really one about the lack of education. I mean, a lot of these projects are incredibly well designed. They're award-winning in terms of, uh, of, of, their, of, of their aesthetic, if you will. And so when you look at them, when they're completed, people go, oh my gosh, I had no idea that's, that's a shelter. And you know, you may be driving by someplace, and you, all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, that's a, uh, that's a permanent supportive housing project. And so, so they're beautiful. 
Uh, they are uh, incredibly uh, well designed. They're thoughtful in terms of how they re react and relate to the community. The architecture and design professions are doing a much better job of making sure that they face the community in, a, in an appropriate way. But ultimately, it's about education. Ultimately, it's about this community piece to make sure that the community can not only accept, but also embrace certain types of supportive housing in their communities, because it is so much better than the alternative so much better than the alternative. And so that's about education and outreach and community engagement. And we need to do a much better job because you can remove all the bureaucratic red tape, but at the end of the day, if the community is knocking on the council, uh, council person's office door and saying, we can't have this in our neighborhood, that's where, we, that's where it becomes political. And what we need instead is community saying, we embrace this in our community because the alternative is unacceptable. Thank you. And, and one way that we as kind of a society have in some instances chosen to not embrace it is with the criminalization of, of poverty. Um, so specifically, Rachel, I know that uh, we've talked before and you've kind of seen the revolving door of the criminal justice sy system and poverty, particularly with individuals that are basically being prosecuted for their uh, impoverished status. Um, so can you sh shed a little bit more light of your experience with that? Sure. Um, you know, people are often shocked when I tell them that there is an actual criminal offense for sitting, sleeping, or lying on a public sidewalk. Um, when I was a public defender, I would consistently have clients who were charged with the crime of being homeless, um, literally for sleeping on the sidewalk, for having an encampment. Um, Efforts have been made to try and start to decrease that criminalization, specifically of homelessness. Um, but I think it's even broader. We have to think about the effect of criminalizing all of the offenses, these low level offenses that disproportionately impact uh, people who have low economic status in our communities. Um, you know, I'll tell you a quick example of a case where um, you may not even think about the houselessness impact in a case, looking at it specifically from a prosecutorial standpoint. So I had a client who was severely mentally ill um, and had a history of homelessness, houselessness throughout his life. Um, two years prior to, I, to me meeting him, he had been arrested for allegedly spitting out a security guard. Um, since the time of that arrest, he found um, housing. Mm -hmm. He was in a different county. He was doing a lot better. He was getting mental health treatment. Um, and then the federal prosecutor decided, I'm going to charge him two years later. Um, went and arrested him in the shelter, brought him to LA County, brought a case against him. Um, his mental health status severely declined while he was in custody. Um, we went to trial and we won. So the criminal justice system did what it was supposed to do. We won. This individual was then released out into the streets of LA with no home, no shelter, mm -hmm. no mental health treatment, and was significantly in a worse situation than when he had started. And oftentimes, you know, not to blame it on prosecutors, when you're looking at a scenario like that, you're looking at, oh, well, this person may be committed this crime, let me prosecute this offense. But you don't really think about the larger implications. And you don't really think about, you know, would providing treatment, would providing mental health care be an appropriate response that would actually start to reduce the crime rather than cycling people in and out of jail so that they increase their um, lack of access to housing, increased lack of access to mental health care treatment, and then perpetuating this cycle where we see people um, increasing in houselessness and increasing in incarceration. Um, as we've seen an increase in the prosecution of houselessness in LA, we've also seen the increase in houselessness. So what we know is that it's not working. Criminalizing poverty isn't working. And so I think it, it goes hand in hand with what Adam and David are talking about when we talk about the public saying, you know, what is my thought process when I think about housing, when I think about our houseless neighbors? Um, it's about the public changing the viewpoint and thinking, you know, maybe I don't want this person on the street to be criminalized. Maybe I think and I agree that treatment or services or another alternative is more effective and would actually begin to allow for increased housing. 
how, how do we address that? How, do, how can we um, in the audience, who should we be talking to? How do we make a difference for those types of situations? In the criminal justice system specifically, I think number one, it's very important to look at your ballot, to look at who the prosecutor is. You have a choice to make that decision um, in November. Look at their history when it comes to houselessness um, and then just get engaged and get involved. I think part of the problem is prosecutor responses to houselessness and law enforcement responses to houselessness are very interwoven with public responses to houselessness. Um, when the public is calling the police because they don't like seeing someone houseless on their block, um, that increase, increases the criminalization of houselessness. And so we all have to kind of look internally and say, how can I shift my viewpoint and look at this in a different way? If I can add to that, Nick, because at Inner City Law Center, it's the single biggest thing that we hear when we first encounter our clients um, in shelters or on the streets that they want legal help with is clearing up tickets, often what we call quality of life tickets for jaywalking or other sorts of things. The, the burden of those hanging over people is often the first thing that they want a lawyer to address. Um, so we often, like I mentioned our, our homeless vets clients earlier, we often start by clearing tickets for them and then eventually get to the fact, well, why aren't you on VA benefits? You know, oh, I tried two years ago and I was denied. And, but it's the entry point is often those criminal justice issues that they're struggling with. And we need to find a different mechanism so that when somebody needs assistance, their, their first call is not to the police, right? When you're dealing, when you need help, who do you call? You call the police to come and help with that situation. That is increasing, as Rachel just said, the likelihood that that person will have a criminal justice, you know, that person on the street will be connected to the criminal justice system or further connected to the criminal justice system and will make housing them down the line harder. So we need, we need to develop public policy alternatives where there's different people to call, where you can call and have a mental health professional or a social worker or other folks come out far more than we do now. Right now, the resources that are available for people to call, starting to change a little bit, but it's overwhelmingly law enforcement resources. And most of these situations aren't really law enforcement situations. We ought to have alternative ways to address them. Yeah, and I'll just add one, one comment that I, I know both um, Adam and Rachel are very familiar with, which is the Boise decision, uh, the Ninth Circuit decision that uh, we are now uh, abiding by, hopefully, uh, here in Los Angeles, being part of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, uh, petition to the United States Supreme Court for review was denied, so that is now the law of the Ninth Circuit. And it essentially is this, it, the case addresses this tension between uh, the presence of homelessness, if you will, that is being on the street in, in a state of homelessness and um, the distinction between certain behaviors that may otherwise be unlawful uh, or illegal. And essentially that case held that uh, offers, officers in law enforcement cannot uh, remove a person against their will, uh, who in this case was a person sleeping in a park, unless they have enough shelters available for the entire population in that community, which by the way is a challenging standard uh, to say the least. Um, but the point is that the, that physical presence of being homeless uh, on the street is not a crime and it cannot be, someone cannot be removed against their, uh, their will. Uh, that case also had an added complexity in that uh, there were charities that were involved that were trying to provide beds and uh, trying to be helpful. But uh, again, there was a sort of an implicit concern about uh, coercion in terms of religion and, and again, forcibly requiring someone to go into a facility uh, against their will. So. That I think against that backdrop is um, uh, going to be one that we are going to continue to have to, to deal with. But again, and I'm sure Adam deals with this at the law center on a pretty consistent basis, which is sometimes the officers will say, well, it's not the presence that's on the street. It's illegal activity. It's selling drugs. It's urination and defecation. It's behavioral issues that we are focused on, not the presence. And so that tension in the law, I think, is still going to be there uh, for some time. It may be worth, Nick, for the audience pointing out that about three quarters of people who are homeless on any given night in Los Angeles are on the streets or in their cars. They're not in shelters. We have, as a number of, of cities do, we have a particularly high number of unsheltered folks every night. Thank you. I'm going to uh, come back to, I, I'm, somebody mentioned um, that about shelters or transitional housing and saying that sometimes you can't quite tell what it is. 
Um, so, so I want to incorporate that into a question from the audience. And um, one of the questions basically says, in your opinion, what role does the design of our public spaces play in this discourse as we work to build more supportive housing? So how do, how do we think design plays into this, especially because I'd imagine a lot of our audience here are um, architects or designers. So what, what can they be doing in their craft that um, addresses or is part of this discourse? From my perspective as a land use attorney, um, you know, Nick, I would say it's huge. I would say that it, it goes to this whole question of um, public acceptance of, of facilities. And, and design and how, how the uh, pedestrian experience relates to the facility, how the facility from a site planning standpoint relates to the adjacent community. So it's, a, it's in my judgment, a really, really important piece of the equation in terms of community acceptance, community buy-in, thoughtful design, uh, not only for the community, but for the residents themselves. How are they going to be functioning in these facilities? Access to services. How, are, how is that going to happen in a very seamless uh, way? Um, so design and architecture, I think, are paramount in terms of how we uh, successfully get community buy-in uh, for, for these facilities and, and removing, you know, the myths about uh, what a shelter is or should be or historically might have been uh, and showing you know, the communities that, you know, these are incredibly well designed, well thought out, well planned facilities. Uh, that in my mind uh, really uh, addresses the education component for community acceptance. So it's a, it's a big issue. And with respect to public places in particular, what I see a lot of is design that's intentionally exclusionary and intentionally trying to keep people who are uh, homeless out uh, and make, you know, to make the bench so they can't lie down on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think the first step with respect to public places is just to not embrace that approach, but rather to embrace an approach of everybody who's part of this community. Or how do we include them? How do we design so they can all be part of, of, of whatever the public space is that's being designed? So even just that, that mindset needs to be different than a lot of what I see. Thank you. So I'm gonna to turn to something that's a bit more current. Um, LA County, the city of LA, California, the federal government, they've all rolled up out um, eviction moratoriums and bills to prevent at-risk families and individuals experience, immediately experiencing home homelessness. Um, however, most of those have a, uh, an end and most of them still require that the rent be eventually paid. And so it seems like it's an impending avalanche coming here. And so what are some things that we can do proactively, proactive to get ahead of this? Because it's going to cause quite a bit of problems, I imagine, for many, many, many people. Well, I can take that one for starters. Um, the eviction process without an attorney is almost automatic eviction for everybody. Um, one of our board members a number of years ago picked 100 random folks going through the eviction process and uh, who did not have representation and followed them through the eviction process and found that 100% of them, all 100 of them were evicted. That's pretty normal for what happens if you don't have an attorney going through the eviction process. So one thing we need to do is to, and there's efforts to do this in Los Angeles and elsewhere, but to create a right to counsel for people who low income folks who are facing eviction. The landlords are, are usually represented in those cases and the tenants are rarely represented in those cases. We need to change that. At Inner City Law Center, 62% of the eviction cases we take on end up with the, the family staying in their unit at the end of that process. So just having representation makes a world of difference in whether or not folks can stay housed or whether or not they end up getting kicked out. So the first thing I would say is to really support efforts to have representation in that process. Um, it is a huge problem that, that we've sort of kicked the can down the road on a bit. Um, most of the restrictions that are in place at the moment uh, apply to folks who cannot afford to pay rent because of COVID. And there's a whole process which is different under federal and state and local laws is the, the hoops they have to jump through to establish that. Um, but, um, but all that rent is still due. It's just that they can't be evicted at the moment for it. Uh, and there's lots of other things that people can still be evicted for in this moment. 
So there's still still uh, eviction actions going on at the moment, and once once the current protections are lifted, there's going to be a huge backlog of folks who are struggling to pay rent. I believe that the solution is that that rent should not be postponed, um, but rather rent should be forgiven. Um, we need a program nationally that says because of COVID, lots of tenants cannot afford to pay rent, and if they can establish that, then the rent is not due. Now that has implications for landlords. That has implications for mortgage payments, right? It feeds all the way up the chain. And we can't just deal with it at the tenant level. We need to figure out what does that mean for landlords who now aren't getting rent payments? What does that mean for their mortgage payments? We need to deal with all those pieces. But usually the way our national public policy works on these sorts of things is we just deal with it at the financial institution level and think about it at that level and don't force it to trickle down. Um, we need to start at the bottom. We need to start with people who can't afford to pay rent because of COVID. We need to say they're not going to get kicked out and be a public health risk. And they're also not going to be a, a, a risk of homelessness six months from now or whatever it is when these uh, eviction protections are lifted. Uh, but then we need to deal with it throughout that chain. Thank you. So we're getting a little short on our time. Um, so I want to give you all kind of your last hurrah. You know, this off this very, as, as Adam, you mentioned at the beginning, a very multifaceted uh, problem um, can sometimes seem overwhelming, especially to those of us who may not be on the battleground five minute like the three of you are. So what would you say to us? What can we do? What, what do you want to leave us with? I guess I'll, I'll go, Rachel, you can go first. <laughs> Sure. So um, I talk thank, about. Thank, thank you, Rachel. That gives David and I another second to think. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, you know, when I think about these issues, I often think about people that I represented who were kind of struggling through these issues. Um, and I had this one client, one of my favorite clients, who was consistently charged with, um, you know, offenses that are very closely tied to being houseless. Um, and he would just keep coming back to court with his tickets, um, sleeping on the sidewalk, um, having an encampment that was too large, um, jaywalking, um, all of the different sorts of offenses you could think of for someone who just doesn't have a home. And he would come to court and every time he had his little um, shopping bag as his bag and he had all his citations in his bag and he would give me the new one every time and I would just be like, oh my God, okay, so now you have a new case, all right. Um, and so on each of the cases, I told him in the criminal justice system, you have two options. You can plead guilty or we can go to trial and we can fight it. And this client would tell me, no, I don't, I don't want either of those options. And I would tell him, well, I'm sorry. I, you know, I don't either. I don't think this is just, but you only have two options. You either go to trial or you plead guilty. And he would say, no, I don't want that. I don't think I should be charged with this. Um, and in the end, you know, we fought really, really hard and we got his citations dismissed. But the moral of the story for me was, you know, we see houselessness, it becomes normalized. We see criminalization of poverty, it becomes normalized. And us in the system, us in the streets, us in the communities, we often just think, well, that's the way it is. Um, that's the system we have. There's not much more you can do. Um, and so I challenge myself to be more like that client, to say, no, I'm not going to accept it. It may be the way it is now, but I'm going to fight and I'm going to change and I'm going to do my part to be a part of the solution and not to be part of continuing this cycle that really just harms um, the most marginalized in our communities. So that's my charge for myself and that would be my charge for everyone. You know, look at your ballots. There's important um, measures. There's important people that need to be considered for election. Um, get involved, go listen to a city council hearing, you know, uh, pay attention to what's happening at the local level um, in our state and see what can you do, even if it's a small piece, what can you do to be a part of the solution? Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Well, I'll jump in. Uh, Adam, I'll give you a little more time to ponder your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think, Nick, my, my parting comment on this is, uh, you know, the city of Los Angeles in the post-war era was planned for and zoned for 10 million homes. And we have systematically over time down zoned our city to less than 5 million homes, most predominantly with Prop U uh, and other measures to down zone our city. And right now 
our population in the city of Los Angeles is exactly at that number. So we are maxed out in terms of our zoning and our land use authority to create more housing. So what instead we do is we have this project by project, uh, very transactional approach to how we create more housing. And if we wanna be bold and if we wanna create more housing and particularly the, the, the number of units that we're talking about at the affordable level, um, 500,000 or more units, we really have to get real about our zoning in, in Los Angeles. And so my parting comment is we really need to have a broad-based uh, approach and, and this very likely may have to come through an initiative to rezone our commercial corridors to create high density development around transportation and around transit so that we can actually create a lot more affordable housing. And by a lot, I mean a lot. And our communities need to begin to accept it. We can preserve our cherished single family neighborhoods in Los Angeles at the same time create a lot more housing on our commercial corridors. But the only way we're gonna do that is we've gotta go through a, a very significant rezoning effort. And we've gotta bring back the original vision which was 10 million uh, units in, in Los Angeles. If we do that, that's a good start. Thank you, David. Adam, sorry, we can't stall anymore for you. <laughs> that's all right. So I got th three, three things I'd say. One is to encourage folks to get involved with organizations that are working on these issues. Um, David mentioned Skid Row Housing Trust at the outset, which is a fabulous organization that builds and operates uh, permanent supportive housing in Los Angeles. So there's lots of, of really great organizations in Los Angeles who are working on this issue, who need, uh, they need monetary support, they need board members, they need uh, uh, volunteers, they need staff members, they need all sorts of stuff. So get, you know, find some organizations that resonate with you uh, and really get engaged would be the first one. The second thing I'd say is, and it goes to the political stuff we've been talking about, is to keep the pressure or put the pressure on your elected officials. Um, is to really, I mean, they need to know that you care about this issue. Even if you don't know exactly what the solution is, that you want them to solve it. Um, that will force them to keep figuring out how they can be a leader on this issue or to figure out how they can be a leader in this issue if that's what you're telling them you want. And the last thing would be to double down on what David said about needing a lot more affordable housing and zoning being a big piece of that. I think that the addition I would make to that is that I think too often we talk about um, zoning and housing and not often enough about affordable housing. I think that the, the, the bargain that needs to be struck is that we need to decide to address our, our homelessness crisis. We need a lot more affordable housing and therefore we're willing to upzone, we're willing to require things in neighborhoods, we're willing to you know, have setbacks be less or have parking requirements be less or allow something to be a bit higher or to you know, reduce this fee or expedite this process. We need a package of all the things that can make it easier to build more affordable housing in exchange for that housing that's being built to truly be affordable. Uh, so that it addresses the homelessness uh, crisis that we have. That feels like the, the, the package that we might be able to get a wide swath of fight folks behind and get enough political will behind to actually have the units we need that would help eventually to end our homelessness crisis in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been very insightful, at least for me, if not anybody else, I had a great time and I learned quite a bit from this. I want to, again, thank the three of you so much for uh, your words, for taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank, again, thank the museum and the uh, inclusion, and community co inclusion and Community Committee and those that helped put this on. Thank you all at home, again, for taking some time uh, to uh, learn more about this as well. A few small announcements. On September 24th, the museum will be having another panel entitled Identity Aesthetics in the Built Environment. So please take a look at the, uh, the museum to find more information about that. And as we've heard uh, throughout this, we do have an election coming up. Um, so please make sure that you vote. Um, also keep in mind that in California, October 19th is the last day to register to vote. So that's coming up very soon. Um, so please make sure you are registered and please make sure you vote. Uh, thank you to our esteemed panelists once again. And with that, I wish everyone a, to have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you Rachel. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Nick.